Almost 25,000 model 1858 star revolvers were produced in the late 1850s and early 1860s. Many of them found their way into military service during the Civil War. This revolver has a faint, burned-in inspector's cartouche of the inspector's initials on the lower part of its left grip, indicating that it was owned by the U.S. military. But unfortunately, the cartouche is so worn as to be illegible, and no other history is known for this revolver. Number nine. Standard Arms Company, 30 caliber, semi-automatic, slash, slide action, repeating rifle. Well, the design for this unusual rifle was patented in 1906, and the rifles themselves were manufactured from 1909 to 1911. M.F. Smith designed this rifle, which was the first gas-operated semi-automatic sporting rifle. Semi-automatic means this rifle automatically reloaded a self-contained metallic cartridge after each shot, so the gun would fire each time the trigger was pulled, up to five shots. Winchester and Remington had already introduced semi-automatic rifles that had become popular, but none of them used this gas operating system of the standard arms rifle. Now, due to its complicated design and unreliability, the standard arms rifle never gained much popularity. It was manufactured in very limited quantities, probably no more than 12,000 total. Sam John's notebook states that he acquired this rifle from Tom Lincoln of Kalispell, and over the years he acquired a number of guns from Mr. Lincoln. The most unusual design feature of the standard arms rifle is that it offered the shooter the option of semi-automatic or manual slide action operation simply by opening or closing a valve that's located below the muzzle of the barrel. And you can see at the end of the gas tube, there's a little a square-headed uh, protuberance. That's, that's the valve. Now, some kind of wrench was required to turn this valve. Perhaps the manufacturer wanted to reassure the purchasers that the rifle would still function even if the gas operating system should fail. This rifle is visually striking because of the ornate cast brass slide handle covers. There's some kind of cat. And there's a moose. And it also has a cast brass butt plate, which is with interwoven SAC for Standard Arms Company. Number eight, Colt Model 1871-72 Open Top Revolver. The 44 caliber Model 1871-72 Revolver was Colt's first revolver model to chamber self-contained metallic case cartridges rather than using the older percussion system which required the shooter to load powder, ball, and percussion cap separately. American cartridge revolvers have been around since 1857, specifically in Smith and Wesson revolvers. But Colt had been reluctant to pay royalties to Rollin White, who was the patent holder for the board through cylinder design that was necessary to accommodate self contained copper or brass case cartridges. When White's patent expired in 1869, Colt was free to produce cartridge revolvers without paying royalties. The open top revolver was their first effort. The design wasn't very successful. Only about 7,000 were made. This heavily ornamented, nickel-plated open top revolver with Tiffany-style stock comes from the Tamas Day collection. From the serial numbers, we can tell that this revolver was manufactured by Colt in 1872. Colt Company records show the revolver was shipped to H&D Folsom Arms of New York City in September of 1874. It's quite possible that the ornate Tiffany-style stock was fitted by Folsom. And it's possible that Folsom had the frame, barrel, and ejector housing engraved with the scroll work. 
typical of the style of the famous firearms engraver, L.D. Nimschke, who worked in New York City in the 1860s and 70s. And perhaps the beautiful engraving was even done by Nimschke himself. The stock is nickel-plated, elaborately cast brass with Civil War motifs. And you can see some of the brass peeking through down there at the bottom of the stock. On each side of the stock is an oval relief panel with a Civil War battle scene. On the back of the stock is a relief panel with a spear and axe projecting from a shield with stars and stripes motif. And on the bottom of the stock is the relief of an American eagle. Now unfortunately, other than the names of several recent collectors, we know nothing about the history of ownership of this piece. Number seven. Fishhawks, Henry Rifle. Well, the Henry Rifle, patented in the fall of 1860, was the first of two successful lever-action repeating rifles, the other being the Spencer. Lever-action rifles used self-contained cartridges and could be reloaded between shots by the shooter simply working a lever forward and then back. The Henry was manufactured by the New Haven Arms Company, whose president was Oliver Winchester. New Haven Arms would morph into the Winchester Repeating Arms Company in 1866. In fact, this is generally considered to be the first Winchester rifle. The rifle could hold 16 44 caliber cartridges. Montana pioneer Edward Ordway described the Henry thus. He said, It was short-ranged and could do but little damage beyond 200 yards, but it was as nearly mechanically perfect as any machine gun could be made, and in the hands of men of that day, 16 shots could be fired with astonishing rapidity. This rifle is part of the Johns collection. And Sam Johns recorded on a tag on the gun, this Henry rifle belonged to Fishhawk, Nez Perce Indian chief with Chief Joseph. He and a few followers were the only ones to reach Canada in their run for the border. That's in late September or early October, 1877. He located with his followers on Pincher Creek. Jep Stanford secured this gun from Fishhawk at Fort McLeod, 1884. Now, from the information on Sam John's tag, we cannot be ironclad certain that this Henry rifle was actually used in the so-called Nez Perce War, although John certainly implies that it was. It is well documented that more than 200 Nez Perce did successfully evade capture at the Bear's Paw and crossed into Canada to live as refugees with, Saint, with Sitting Bull's Lakota at Fort McLeod, settling on Pincher Creek. There is also a record of a Nez Perce man named Fishhawk who had several brushes with the Canadian authorities at Fort McLeod. Now, I didn't find a photograph of Fishhawk, but I did find this undated photo of Tsitkaltsa, a Nez Perce man who went on the 1,100-mile fighting retreat of 1877. Along with 400 other Nez Perce, he was captured by the U.S. Army at the Bear's Paw, south of Haver. He holds a Henry rifle virtually, for, excuse me, virtually identical to Fishhawk's Henry. And here's an historical aside. Sitkaltsa was born circa 1807. With his blue eyes and red hair, he was believed by the Nez Perce and many whites to be the son of Captain William Clark. Conceived in the spring of 1806 during the month the returning Lewis and Clark expedition spent with the Nez Perce in Idaho while waiting for the snow to melt so they could cross Lolo Pass into Montana. Number six, Sharps Model 1874 Presentation Sporting Rifle. Well, this Sharps Model 1874 rifle is from the Bob Scriber collection. And this is the type of gun that helped spell the end of the large buffalo herds. 
But by the time this fancy rifle was made and presented, the great herds were pretty much gone. This breech loading single shot rifle chambers a 40 90 cartridge. That's 40 caliber and 90 grains of black powder. This is a powerful cartridge. Uh, for comparison, a cartridge from Fishhawk's Henry rifle had only about 28 grains of black powder, less than a third of the powder in a cartridge of this big sharps. The 30 inch octagonal barrel is topped with. F.W. Freund sights, and uh, F.W. Freund, along with his brother George, operated gun shops west of the Mississippi, first out of tents, and uh, later they started gun stores in Cheyenne, Denver, and Durango, Colorado. Freund was noted for the improvements he innovated for Sharps rifles. There's the front sight. The fancy walnut buttstock is checkered around the wrist. This costs extra. And the buttstock has a carved pistol grip. This also costs extra. The forestock, also checkered, and the cap on the forestock is carved horn. Quite unusual. This is a fancy rifle. Now on the bottom of the buttstock is an inlet oval silver plaque which is engraved G. H. Collins from S. H. and G. Xmas, 1879. Well, my friend Dave Thorne thought that S. H. and G. must certainly stand for Schuyler, Hartley, and Graham of New York City. They were the largest American wholesaler of military goods and firearms in the late 19th century. They'd gone into business before the Civil War. Company records still extant do show that Sharp sent this gun to Schuyler, Hartley, and Graham in a shipment of 121 rifles in September of 1879. We still had no idea who J.H. Collins had been until after a write-up about this rifle appeared in the Sharp's Collector's Report, a quarterly magazine for fanciers of Sharp's rifles. And there, there was part of a series on Sharp's rifles in the MHS collection. Now, shortly after the article was published, Dave Thorne, who is also an editor of the Collector's Report, received a letter from a Doug McChristian. Doug, now unfortunately deceased, was an historian who had served at Little Bighorn Battlefield, Battlefield and also at Fort Bowie in Arizona. Doug's letter read, in part, Gilbert H. Collins was the brother of John S. Collins, who secured the post-traitorship at Fort Laramie, Wyoming Territory in late 1872. For a decade thereafter, the Collins brothers shared the appointment for that lucrative business. They undoubtedly did much business with S, H, and G, thus the presentation to Gilbert. Gilbert actually held the license at the time he received the rifle in 1879. Now, generally, catalogers are not extensive researchers, but function mainly just to record the information that's known about the artifact. Time constraints preclude more cursory research. And I like this rifle because a good deal of information about the history of the piece came to us quite serendipitously. Number five. Big Medicine's Colt Single Action Army Revolver. Well, the Colt Single Action Army Revolver was first manufactured in 1873. It was the first cartridge revolver made by Colt to have significant sales. When we think of cowboys today, this is the revolver we think of, although this particular revolver was owned by a member of the Crow Tribe. This presentation revolver with mother of pearl grips which is part of the Tamas Day collection, was given to the chief of the Crow Tribal Police, Big Medicine, in 1898. It was on the occasion of his installation into that position. Big Medicine was born in about 1857. He served as a messenger for the U.S. Army during the 1876-77 campaign against the Sioux and Cheyenne. 
As a mature man, he became a prominent leader of the Crow tribe. He joined the tribal police in about uh, 1885. And that's him on the right, and he's holding the Colt revolver. At his swearing in as chief of police in 1898, he had been presented the 45 caliber factory engraved Colt revolver with gun belt by Lieutenant J.W. Watson and 17 other Army officers. Big Medicine, Chief of Police, his factory engraved on the top of the barrel. Big Medicine lived until 1926. Number four, Frank Bird Linderman's Ballard Rifle. Frank Bird Linderman was born in 1869 in Cleveland, Ohio. When he was only 16, he came to Montana where he worked as a fur trapper, a guide, and an assayer. Linderman later became a newspaper publisher, a writer of some repute, and a staunch advocate for American Indian rights. Notably, he helped Crow Chief Plenty Coup publish his autobiography. He tried his hand at politics, serving two years in the state legislature, he later ran unsuccessfully for the U.S. Senate. Linderman was a friend of Charlie Russell. He was also, coincidentally, a longtime friend of Sam Johns and became his brother-in-law when he married Sam's sister, Minnie. In 1890, Linderman served as a hunting guide in the Flathead country for a party composed of ex-territorial governor Samuel Hauser, Missoula judge Frank Woody, and businessman Stearns Blake. Sam John says in his notebook, while sitting around the campfire one night, they talked guns, and Frank described a gun one day he was going to own. About a month later, Frank was surprised to find a package addressed to him. It did not take him long to remove the wrappings, and he was overjoyed to find the gun of his dreams with Lyman bead sight. His hunting friends had not forgotten. Well, Frank Linderman's dream rifle, which Linderman says in his published memoir was custom made to his specifications, is a breech-loading, single-shot Ballard Union Hill No. 8. It chambers a 3240 cartridge, that's 32 caliber, 40 grains of black powder. Marlin originated this cartridge for its Ballard Hill, Union Hill rifles. The 3240 is not a powerful cartridge, uh, not by today's standards, but in its day it was renowned for its accuracy and considered plenty ad adequate for deer or even for elk or moose at close range. The rifle has a very long, for a cartridge rifle, 30-inch barrel. And notably, it has a Schutzen-style butt plate with projecting horns that would normally be found only on a target rifle, not on a sporting rifle. The rifle has a tang-mounted Lyman aperture sight. Um, it's a peep sight suitable for target shooting. The aperture itself is unfortunately now missing. Uh, apparently, Frank Linderman valued accuracy above all else in his dream rifle. Union Hill No. 8 rifles were made on a Ballard patent by the Marlin Firearms Company of New Haven, Connecticut between 1884 and 1890. Uh, this rifle must be one of the very last of its kind made. Number three, Henry Plummer's Van Wart Sons and Company shotgun. Well, Henry Plummer was a bad guy. Or perhaps he's just an innocent guy that was misunderstood. It all depends on who you talk to today. One thing's for sure. In early January of 1864, while he was serving as the sheriff for the mining camp of Bannock, Plummer was accused of being the leader of a gang of criminals that had been committing robbery and murder on the roads of the area and was summarily hanged by the Montana vigilantes. This Van Wart Sons and Company 10-gauge shotgun, double barrel, muzzle loading, 
is stamped warranted on the siding plane between its two woven iron and steel so-called Damascus barrels. It was donated to the Historical Society in 1913 by Amade Bassett, who had had it in his possession since 1869. Now, according to Bassett, Plummer kept his shotgun in the front of George Crispin's store in Bannock, and uh, it was for easy access. And after Plummer was hanged, hotel owner Bill Goodrich claimed the shotgun in lieu of an unpaid $275 $5 bill, and that was owed him by Plummer. Sometime later, Goodrich, in need of a drink, the story goes, sold the gun to his friend Fred Pack for 40 bucks. That would be about $1,000 today. An expensive drink. <laughs> and Amade Bissett subsequently bought the shotgun from Pack for the same price, $50. This is Henry Plummer's grave just outside of the mining camp of Bannock. Number two, Jim Bridger's Hawken Plains Rifle. Well, this is an iconic percussion muzzle-loading rifle once owned by an iconic mountain man. Jim Bridger was born in Richmond, Virginia in 1804. When he was still in his teens, he came west to St. Louis where he joined the initial fur trapping brigade of the Rocky Mountain Fur Company, which was sent to the central Rocky Mountains of Colorado and Wyoming by W.H. Ashley in 1822. In, 19, excuse me, in 1830, Bridger became a full partner in the Rocky Mountain Fur Company, which unfortunately for him, failed in 1834. He continued beaver trapping in the Rockies till about 1840 when the beaver trade was done. A few years after the beaver trade failed, Bridger with partner Louis Vasquez established a trading post in what's now the extreme southwest corner of Wyoming uh, so to supply emigrant wagon trains bound for Oregon, California, and Salt Lake. And in the early 1860s, Bridger pioneered the wagon road that bore his name from the emigrant road in central Wyoming north through the Bighorn Basin to the gold fields of Montana. And the Bridger Trail ran west of the Bighorn Mountains, so it avoided the dangerous hunting grounds of the Sioux and Cheyenne that, that were east of the mountains. But it was never a popular route to the gold fields, largely because it offered only limited access to water and grazing. In the late 1860s, Jim Bridger served as a scout for the U.S. Army. In 1865, Jim Bridger sold this hawk and rifle for $65 to Pierre Chen at Fort C.F. Smith in south central Montana. The Hawken brothers Jacob and Samuel had gone into the gun business in St. Louis as partners sometime in the early 1920s. They produced a variety of kinds of muzzle-loading rifles and shotguns. They're best known for their Plains rifles. Plains rifles differed from the American rifles that preceded them, um, including the famous Kentucky rifles, principally in that the Plains rifles had shorter, heavier barrels larger diameter bear, bores, 53 caliber and larger, and much more robust half stocks. Plains rifles, because of their shorter barrels, were designed to be easier to carry on horseback or to manage in thick timber. This rifle has a 33 inch long barrel and it's 54 caliber. Their large calibers ensured that the Plains rifles were more effective against big animals, including buffalo, even grizzly bears. Their beefier stocks, often made of maple, like the Bridger Hawkins, made them more resistant to breakage under rough use. Now we know this rifle was made sometime after 1849 because the top of the barrel is stamped S. Hawken for Samuel Hawken. The first rifles the Hawken brothers made were barrel stamped J and S Hawken for Jacob and Samuel Hawken, but 
After Jake Hawkins died from cholera in 1849, the surviving brother, Sam, began stamping his burial simply S. Hawkins. Pierre Shang kept this rifle under until just before his death when he gave it to frontier scout and guide J.I. Allen. Allen kept the Hawken for some 30 years and donated the rifle to the Montana Historical Society in 1910. You can see Jim Bridger's Hawken rifle on display. It's, it's in a case in the fur trapping section of the Homeland exhibit. It's uh, just straight out of, of these doors. Number 2A, I didn't want to have 13 guns. <laughs> J&S Hawken rifle. For comparison, here's another muzzle-loading Hawken rifle in the MHX collection, which is not a classic Plains rifle. The top of this rifle barrel is stamped J and S Hawken, which means the rifle was almost certainly produced sometime before Jake Hawkins' 1849 death, possibly as early as the 1830s. Samuel Johns obtained this rifle, presumably in the 1930s, from an F.G. Ellis of Webster Grove, Missouri. Webster Grove is a suburb of St. Louis. And so this rifle may not have traveled very far in its lifetime before Sam Johns obtained it. The J and S Hawken rifle is 50 caliber. It has a 38 and a quarter inch long barrel, almost half a foot longer than the Bridger Hawkins barrel. Its walnut half stock is much more delicately made than the maple half stock of the Bridger Hawken. And this JNS Hawken rifle provides a clear contrast to the form that the Hawken Brothers Plains rifles eventually took to meet the rigorous needs of the Western frontier. Okay, drum roll. Here's my somewhat arbitrary, but still wonderful, top choice for most interesting firearm in the Montana Historical Society collection. Number one. Horn Miller's handmade rifle. Well, we've all heard that necessity is the mother of invention. And I think Adam Horn Miller's handmade rifle certainly proves it. This rifle is my number one favorite because it's unique, because it's perfectly designed for the environment in which it must have been used. Adam Hahn Miller was born in Bavaria in 1840. And while still a child, came to St. Louis with his parents. One, one unsubstantiated source has him coming up to Missouri on a fur company keelboat while he was still in his teens. It's certain that in about 1870, Adam Miller, now called Horn, with two other men, made a substantial gold strike near what's now Cook City. It became the New World Mining District. The, in fact, the three men, Miller along with A. Bart Henderson and Ed Hibbard, are considered to be the founders of Cook City. During the Nez Perce War, Horn Miller served as a scout for Colonel John Reddington. He later worked as a guide in Yellowstone National Park. Adam Horn Miller died in 1917. He's buried in the Cook City Cemetery, a place he chose facing east under a large conifer tree. Horn Miller's rifle was donated to the Montana Historical Society in 1920, only three years after his death. And it was donated by a John Bozeman work. Horn Miller's rifle appears to me to be well designed for use in the Rocky Mountain West. In many ways, it seems to me this rifle is a breech-loading recapitulation of the Plains rifle. It's short, rugged, and powerful single-shot weapon. It is short, just over three feet long overall, for convenient use in thick timber or to carry easily crossways behind the pommel of a saddle. The single-shot rifle chambers a 5090 Sharps cartridge a cartridge which Sharps introduced in 1872 for buffalo hunting. That's 90 grains of black powder propelling a half-inch di diameter bullet. 
It is powerful enough to bring down any animal in the Rockies. Horn Miller's rifle incorporates a sharp sparrow, but the action is a number one Remington rolling block. It's very strong, compact action, which may have come from a military rifle. The octagonal barrel is just over 25 inches long. The rear buckhorn sight may come originally from a Winchester. And the front sight incorporates a bone or antler blade for good visibility in dim light as on a cloudy day in thick timber. The two-piece stock is crudely fashioned from what appears to be a one or one and a quarter inch thick Douglas fir plank, quite possibly a floorboard. As any builder can tell you, Doug Fir's tough stuff. Cheap, too, compared to walnut or maple. And the, crescent, the crescent butt plate probably came from a Winchester. The forestock has a German silver cap, which, judging from the half-round ramrod channel, was likely originally from some kind of mu muzzle loader. And the buttstock has substantial drop. That is, the center of the butt is considerably lower than the plane of the sights on the top of the barrel, almost like an old Kentucky rifle. And it shows that Horn Miller made his rifle to be perfectly suited for a quick offhand, that standing shot. He could almost instantly line up his eye with the sights without having to scrunch his neck. Well, I find this rifle fascinating because it's absolutely unique and it's so well suited for hunting in thick, dark timber and for defense against a sudden a close encounter with a large predator like Mr. Grizz. And when I thought about it, I figured it could probably handle Mr. Bobcat, too. <laughs> Horn Miller was a rugged man in a rugged country. And it seems to me his handmade rifle is perfectly designed to meet the tough demands of that environment. So those are my top picks from my time spent working with the Montana Historical Society Firearms Collection. Admittedly, these picks are somewhat arbitrary. I could easily have chosen a different dozen guns. I was honored to have been able to work with a gun collection and to have been asked in retirement to put together a gun exhibit for the new iteration of MHS coming to this location sometime soon. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. I'll be glad to try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. So because we live stream these and we have a substantial at-home audience, I'm going to ask that um, you raise your hand to ask questions and you speak into the mic so they can also hear the question and then Vic will answer them. So. Great presentation. Um, quick question for you. It looked like a lot of those single barrel rifles had two triggers tandem triggers and I'm curious I, I understand like you know like a side-by-side -side double barrel shotgun having two triggers but what, what, what what's up with that well that's a great question because I even know the answer <laughs> it's a, <laughs> it's those are those are set triggers and the pulling usually on the almost always on the rear trigger you pull it and it'll click and then the it makes the front trigger a hair trigger, so just a tiny bit of pressure will discharge the piece. That way it makes it easier, you know, squeezing the trigger, you can get to wandering around a bit. That's, uh, that's what it is. Are there any other questions? not have been paying attention. Where was Miller's? What, what did Miller's homemade gun come from? Where? Was it part of the Johns? Oh, um, no, it came from John Bozeman work. It was donated in 1920 as a, a single piece. 
or there may have been one other piece with it, but it was a, a single donation. So first of all, Vic, thanks for a great presentation. Um, I just wanted to say that he left out my favorite firearm in the society's collection, which is a dinosaur gun that was made at uh, Fort Peck in the 1930s by construction workers on the dam. And if you want to learn about that, uh, check out, and on your way out, check out in the store the 101 Objects, uh, History of Montana and 101 Objects, because Vic wrote about that um, in the in the collection. And I, I would say we probably have the only dinosaur gun in the country, maybe. <laughs> Wait a minute, that wasn't a question, Kirby. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> All right, well, uh, thank you very much for coming. And Vic, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Martha.